Welcome to the Apron Academy. This video was specially designed for the dietitian in training, also known as the RD to be. Today we're going to be talking about folate. Now, before anything that I talk about today, uh, normally you see a huge structure right as we're beginning the video, but I want to point this out because this is probably one of the most important things about folate. This is the function of folate, and I want you to know this phrase as we go forward. So folate acts as a donor or acceptor of one carbon units. So now that may sound like French to you as we're as I just said it, but I will explain it as we go forward, but know that this is the ultimate function. Folate acts as that donor and acceptor of one carbon units. So now let's get into where we can find it. Simply, uh, we can find folate in broccoli, pinto beans, lentils, asparagus, but like all of our um, vitamins or most of our vitamins, we do have to break it down before we can absorb it. So let's talk about that. Talking about absorption. So folate is in a polyglutamated form. And so this is the structure I want to talk about, but before we get there, it might help to just see this is folic acid. It only has one glutamate. And then this is THF which is the cofactor form for folate. It has an extra glutamate, has some extra hydrogens, but we'll talk about all that in a second. But I just want you to see that um, this is a smaller form. Um, so folate has a bunch of these glutamates on there. It needs to, um, it can't be absorbed with all the glutamates on it. So it needs to be in the monoglutamated form. Um, it has to be hydrolyzed to that form. Um, and it's hydrolyzed by the enzyme gamma glutamyl hydrolase. Uh, it helps to hydrolyze to this monoglutamated form, which is folic acid. So now let's go back. So when we eat our folate and it's in the folic acid form looking inside of our intestines and zooming in on one of these enterocytes folic acid wants to come in to the cell so that then it can go out go to the rest of the body but before it can get into the cell it has to go through this proton coupled folate transporter or pcft this is the transporter that helps bring that folic acid or the folate into the enterocyte and to other areas of the body, but we're specifically looking at this enterocyte right now. Um, in short, basically once the folic acid gets in here, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on and it gets to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, the THF. Um, you will see this again and this will look like a glorious little picture in comparison to what we are going to look at, but I don't want you to fear, we're going to explain it. So, like with many of our other vitamins, it does have to be broken down into its simplest form. In this case, it is the monoglutamated form in order to be absorbed, but in order to be used, through the rest of the body, it has to get back to that cofactor form or the functional form, and that would be THF. So how does folate or folic acid um, get to be THF? Um, first, I want to mention that there are three steps. The first step to convert folic acid to THF is we need these hydrogens. That is our first step. So there are four hydrogens, tetra, hydrofolate, tetra means four. So we're adding the four hydrogens, simple as that. Um, 
they all go onto here. So you can see in the purple. That's the first step to convert folic acid to THF. The second step is to add another glutamate. So we add it onto this part, add the glutamate on there, voila. The third step is that it picks up a carbon unit and adds it to the five position or the in 10 position. Um, so this is, this is important if we go back to that first sentence that I showed that folate acts as a donor and acceptor of one carbon units. These are the carbon units that I'm talking about. So it's things like methyl, formal, um, they add on to the 5 and the 10 position. So simply enough, that's those are the three steps of how to convert folic acid to THF. And we will talk about that in this. Dun, dun, dun. So let's break it down because all of this is stuff we know. So I don't want you to think this is such a big thing. I don't know what's going on. You really do. I believe in you. So we have the folate. Um, we have talked about the folate in the um, folic acid form, but we need to get it to this THF. We just talked about how it does that. It adds on the hydrogen, adds on the glutamate, and um, adds on a one carbon unit onto uh, the folic acid so that it becomes a tetrahydrofolate. So it doesn't immediately add on the four hydrogens all at the same time. It goes in steps of two. So we have dihydrofolate at first. You do need to know this enzyme that uh, moves this. It is a reductase enzyme. And then you have the same enzyme reductase to get the dihydrofolate into tetrahydrofolate. So now, um, you'll think, what are all of these guys, too many, too many things going on here? Well, each of these is how the THF is kind of adding on these uh, one carbon units. Here are these one carbon units. You have methyl, methylene, uh, formal, all of these. So this is the 5 and the 10. That just shows where it's attaching onto. And then the, whatever the methyl group is called is um, what's being added on there. So I want to point out a couple of things. So this 10 formal and this 5 methyl are the how a lot of let me say this sentence again so a lot of these are the form in which our food comes um we take intake a lot of this form i also want to note that in many of these reactions they're reversible like you can always somehow get to the same point um but for this 5-methyl, it's irreversible. There's no way you can go from tetrahydrofolate to this 5-methyl. It's irreversible. Um, I also want to note that after absorption, this 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is taken into the liver uh, for that portal circulation via the um, P C F T, um, which is this, sorry, my screen is freezing. So this transporter here, um, this is the predominant form that is exported into the plasma. So I also want to note here about folate receptors. We have receptors um, FR alpha, FR beta, FR gamma. They have a high affinity for folic acid, so they're going to go towards that folic acid. 
These receptors help bring folates into the cells by endocytosis. So they're able to get the folate into specific tissues. Um, it's highly expressed in the choroid plexus. So this is um, in the brain to protect the brain from deficiency. So um, there are higher folate levels in the cerebrospinal fluid than any other place in our peripheral circulation or in our body. So we need folate for our brain. Um, it's also highly expressed in the kidney, proximal tubes, um, in the placenta, and even some tumors. So in the cells... Actually, I do not want to talk about that. Ignore what I just said. <laughs> so how does it function? It has uh, this main primary function acting as an acceptor or a donor of one carbon units. And it does this uh, in, this react in these three reactions. So nucleotide synthesis, this is making our RNA, DNA, uh, in the mitochondrial generation of one carbon units. So this has to do with making formate and then methyl catabolism. Scary, right? Let's go back to this. You remember how I said this was going to look a little more complicated? Basically, what it does is bring folate into the cell via this transporter, and then we get 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, this is what this looks like, a little more complicated. Imagine that this is still this erythrocyte um, or enterocyte. And here we go. So the uh, first function, I'm going to talk about this area. This is kind of right as the folic acid comes in. So talking about nucleotide synthesis, um, it's important to note all of these little guys, the purines and pyrimidines. You probably learned this in like high school anatomy or biology. Probably had a little craft where you connected beads, whether it be, you know, these colors. Like the red and the greens can only go together. The orange and the blues can only go together. So guanine and cysteine are the two pairs. Adenine and thymine are the other pairs. And that's seen here. Um, this is in DNA, this adenine-thymine uh, bond. And then in RNA, we see an adenine-uracil bond. So right now in this um, couple of reactions that I'm going to talk about, we're talking about making these purines. So we need to make both, but right now talking about making guadenine and adenine. So this is a little complicated. It says a lot of stuff. So I'm going to break it down. And oftentimes for me, it helps if it's in a linear form. So that's what I'm going to show you. So we start with the folic, folic acid entering our um, cells. And this is our enzyme. It's called dihydrofolate reductase, DHFR. Many times we don't need to know enzymes, but we do need to know this DH, DHFR. So DHFR is what um, is able to add on um, some hydrogens, dihydrofolate, we need the enzyme again to make tetrahydrofolate. And we did talk about this above here. So now in this cell, 
we have the tetrahydrofolate and it's able to move to the 510 methyl tetrahydrofolate. We are using cysteine and getting a glycine. Then we get a 10 formula tetrahydrofolate, which then we're able to get our purines. So simple enough, this is a reaction that we will need to know. Break um, this down, write it on a note card, memorize this. So before I move on, I do want to note that methotrexate is a drug and it inhibits this DA. DHFR. So uh, it inhibits that uh, enzyme and it is most successful in chemotherapies. So why would this be? It can prevent cancer because this reaction is not able to happen and we're not able to uh, make DNA. Um, that helps our cancer because they um, want to multiply and they want to uh, mess up our DNA. So this um, methotrexate that I'm talking about that inhibits the DHFR, it is successful in chemotherapies. It also can be seen in the treatment of arthritis since it inhibits this DNA replication in the T-cells um, that is found in the joints. All right, still talking about purine, um, making those purines, we have the second function which has to do with our mitochondria and uh, folate production. So going back to this scary thing, this is our mitochondria. Um, in essence, we have our tetrahydrofolate and choline that are coming into the mitochondria. You have a bunch of stuff that's going on. And then coming out, you have your formate and THF. Um, with Once you have the formate, it can then go to this uh, tin formula tetrahydrofolate to then get purines. In order to explain this a little bit better, the THF and uh, choline, a bunch of stuff is happening. In each of this, quote, stuff, we're adding and taking off carbon units. So again, that's what folate does, adds and takes off those one carbon units. Then we have the THF and formate, put get that into the tin formula tetrahydrofolate and then into purines. So kind of connecting back to that linear image that I showed you, this is all that's happening. We're able to get formate to come into this reaction. Um, looking at both, I guess, you have the tetrahydrofolate choline, a bunch of stuff is happening. And then we get the folate that goes into this reaction. Now we've made purines. Awesome. We also need the pyrimidines, the um, cysteine and the thymine. We'll also talk about uracil. So going back to this first function, we're making uh, nucleotides. Uh, specifically pyrimidines, this is important thymidylate cycle. We need to know what's about to happen or what we're about to talk about. So I've gone back to this linear. Well, first, before I do that, I'm going to go back to this picture. We're talking about um, this little guy. So we're in the nucleus now, and we're going to talk about this reaction that's going on. So looking at this linearly, we have the same thing that's going on, but focusing in on this 5,10-methyl tetrahydrofolate going into the nucleus, uh, this 5,10-methyl uh, tetrahydrofolate can be pulled into the nucleus, and 
then we start with um, this uracil C to U there, which is used in RNA, like I mentioned before. But then we kind of go in this cycle, the thymidylate cycle, and we finish up with the thymine, which is needed for DNA. So then dihydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate, it just keeps going in this cycle um, to help make these pyrimidines. So I want to quickly talk about a deficiency in uh, folate. So if we have a deficiency in folate, we're not able to make enough in order to drive this reaction forward, so we're only left with this uracil. We can't move it along to make the uh, thymine. So if we're only creating uracil, that means um, we only have the stuff to make RNA. So this increases cancer risk because when our body needs to make DNA, it often will use the uracil instead of this thymine, misincorporating it and causing massive genome instability. So if we don't have enough folate, it can cause a cancer risk and we see this happening in the nucleus in this thymidylate cycle. And now finally, the third function talking about um, the methyl catabolism, we're going to talk about the methionine cycle. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, let me bring you back to this main picture. We're looking right here for this, but I want to bring it back to the um, linear picture. So have this 5,10-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, we have this MTHFR enzyme that is reversible. So if you remember back to that first picture, I talked about how the um, this 5,10-methyl tetrahydrofolate, or not the 5,10, but the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, it, to get to that, that, um, function or process is irreversible. So we have our 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. We can also get this from outside of the cell. Um, it comes in through this RFC, um, and that stands, well, right off the top of my head, I can't remember what it stands for. But anyways, you have this transporter. And it's able to come in the cell, out of the cell, in the cell, out of the cell, right there, but also leads to that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So we have that, and then we have some homocysteine. So this homocysteine is given that 5-methyl, so take this part off. What are you left with? The THF, right here. So then that drives the reaction when the homocysteine is given that 5-methyl, it's turned into methionine, and then we have methylization. So what is important here? Again, let's talk about if we have a deficiency. So if we have this deficiency, then we're not going to have um, enough folate. So it will be hard to make this 5-methyl THF. And then we still have this in our body. So if the homocysteine isn't going in this reaction to be uh, kind of made into this meth methionine, then our homocysteine levels are going to increase. And if it's not able to convert to this meth methionine, homocysteine levels increase, then we have increased levels of cardiovascular disease. So again... We talked about here that not enough folate, you're going to have some cancer risk here in this methionine cycle. If you don't have enough folate, it can lead to cardiovascular disease.
diseases. And I do want to note about um, some genetic mutations. So with this MTHFR enzyme, if there are alterations in this, it can affect the amount of 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate that one has. So that is a possibility for genetic mutations. So what happens if I don't have enough? I just mentioned two ways where um, it can lead to cancer. It can lead to cardiovascular disease. So um, also, if we have supplementation of folic acid, it can reduce the incidence of neural tube defects. So when a woman is pregnant, she needs lots of supplementation of folic acid and in fact she doesn't just need it when she is realizes that she's pregnant she needs it when um she is like thinking about having children or in that um age bearing uh time period so always need folic acid because um the excuse me, the neural tube closes like on the 28th day after conception and often you find out that you're pregnant after that. So we need lots of folic acid. So that's why there are many programs in different countries that require fortification of folate um, because if we're not, you know, intentionally seeking out to eat these folic foods or folate containing foods, then as a potential, potentially um, pregnant woman, then I don't know if I've gotten enough folic acid. So we need folate. Um, it reduces the incidence of neural tube defects or spina bifida in infants. And with this supplementation, it can reduce these incidences by 50%. So that is a huge deal. We also see if we don't have enough, we have defects in DNA synthesis we, and um, methyl metabolism. So those are the um, functions that we just looked at. We also see megaloblastic anemia and also associated with cancer, like I mentioned before, but specifically colon cancer. So as a dietitian, what can I do? I can encourage pregnant women, or even before that, women who are thinking about having children to intake folate. Like I mentioned, we do have fortification in many of our foods, but intentionally, um, intaking that folate is important. And even encouraging everybody. It's not just for the childbearing women. It's for everyone because it helps reduce cancer risk. It helps um, reduce defects in DNA synthesis. All the things. Folate is so important. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and thank you for joining me.